Hello, everyone. Welcome back to uh, the 101st episode of Milkshakes, Markets, and Madness. Yeah, we had our 100th last week, and so I said this week uh, we would talk about the madness surrounding the political markets. And for those who have been watching the show for a while, you will recognize Michael Every, who we've featured on the show a couple months ago, and somebody that I have followed for many years, but only met earlier this year, about nine months ago. Um, but I thought he was the perfect person to come in and talk about the world after Trump has gotten elected, because in many ways, and I don't know if you actually agree with this or not, but it'll, I'll be interested to get your take on this. Is To me, it didn't really matter who was going to be the president in that in many ways, the dice had already been rolled and they just have to, you know, we just have to let it play out. However, Trump being in the White House, I think, certainly enhances or magnifies many of the things that I thought would play out anyway, and, and, in, and in some ways makes them more likely to play out um, had, had Harris won. So in any case, for, for those who are not familiar with Michael, Michael is the global strategist at Rabobank. <clears throat> he lives in Asia, has lived all over the world, many different countries. And so he always has kind of a very unique an interesting take on things. And like I said, I've been following him for seven or eight years. Um, and he has, for all of that time, he has been talking about many of the things that are kind of at the forefront of the political, economic, geopolitical world right now. So, um, you know, th that, that that's what prompted this discussion. And he just wrote another paper either yesterday or today, I can't remember, called global was it global macro strategy is that what you're calling it uh, macro strategy versus grand macro strategy. grand macro strategy that's right and and so what i thought you know it's such a great piece and i encourage people to try to get a hold of it if they can um but i thought what we do is really just kind of walk through that paper and because in many ways it kind of summarizes all the stuff you've been talking about for many years now uh, but kind of lays it at the feet of, of of the recent election. And so I thought we just kind of walk through the framework of it. And then maybe, you know, later on we get into what does this mean for in the actual real world right now? <laughs> uh, but it, but my, fir my first question to you is, w w what were you surprised by the, the, the result of the election or were you expecting it? Uh, what's, and, and, and also what's the reaction like in Asia? Well, in our house view has publicly been for months that Trump would win. I, I didn't set that. That was our US strategist who's done a fantastic job. Um, and you know, we, we've stuck with that even after the Harris got that illusory bounce in the polls. Um, so we weren't professionally surprised. I wasn't personally surprised uh, either because even though everyone kept saying, look, this is a tight race, it's a close race, it's 50 50. I mean, so many cliche headlines like that you know nate silver with his eighty thousand simulations and his razor close and all of them i mean what a what a pseudo scientific bunch of nonsense because yeah. the reality was when you looked at the underlying political arguments and demographic shifts you were either going to see all the battleground states shift left because one set of arguments was winning with one demographic across america or you were going to see them all shift right and red if another set of arguments with another set of demographics was winning. And it always seemed to me that the preponderance of evidence was screamingly obvious um, that it was going to shift to the right and, and the Republicans. And I mean, how people like Alan Lichtman with his is it 13, 16 keys, you know, he can sit there twiddling them impotently and with as many imaginary locks as he wants. You know, I mean, it's, it's not a surprise to put it mildly. Yeah. Well, what I thought was interesting, and, and listen, I'm always a believer that the free market determines things better than any, you know, strategist or government official. And poly market was very clear that Trump was going to win, right? Now that was obviously dominated by by the the whale out of France, but still, that that's a real person in the real world putting his real money on the line based on. And, and it, this wasn't just some fluke deal. This guy had actually, if if you if you understand his methodology for going through and understanding why he made such a big bet. It was actually a very well thought out strategy. So I thought uh, that that was pretty interesting to see the the free market again, pick the winner versus, you know, some kind of uh, a government official. Um, anyway, uh, so you, you, the paper that you, you put out again, you know, one of the things that you have been talking about for a long time is 
what I like to call real politic, right? Um, it's not the ivory tower. This is the way things ought to work. And this is the way a nice, you know, uh, friendly world would work. I mean, you, you've always kind of kind of laid it on the line as far as, listen, the world is not always a nice place. Things don't always work the way models say they do. And political realities are going to trump economic theory uh, when, when, when things get interesting. And th things have definitely gotten interesting here. Um, so what I thought, what I thought, uh, you know, if, if, you, if you don't mind, just give us a quick, you know, two or three minute, you know, overview of the report that you put out. And then I'll throw some questions in there, uh, you know, of the things that, that, that jumped out at me. Yeah, with, with pleasure. So as I was saying, the title of it is Macro Strategy versus Grand Macro Strategy. And just to unpack that, we all know what macro strategy is. You know, if you're looking at markets, you're looking at the economy, which means you're looking at macroeconomics. And yeah, sure, you'll talk about the odd election. And this was an important one. I'm sure we'll get back to that. Um, and every now and then, you know, a regulatory change can matter. But generally, you're looking at the economic cycle, you're looking at the interest rate cycle, and you're looking at, you know, opportunities to read them and, and translate that across to what it means for financial assets. And the world you're dealing with there is economic policy. What I'm stressing is that there is, as you said, this realpolitik background there where politics sits behind everything. And if you live in a global environment in which there isn't any nasty politics internationally, if everyone's friends, then yeah, you can wear that set of lenses and look at everything as an economist. But for most of history, and if you read all the great thinkers, they were saying this thousands of years ago, back to the ancient Greeks and you know, Sun Tzu and China, et cetera, et cetera. It's not a new theory. You have to look at the economy wrapped up with politics. And that's actually called economic statecraft. An economic statecraft is one of three legs of a stool, if you will, where you have the economy, you have political statecraft, and you have military statecraft. And you use the three legs together to try and achieve a nation's grand strategy. Now, what is a grand strategy? It's effectively the crystallization of its key interests. And I, I give the example in the report of the British Empire. Now, the British obviously were a big, uh, institutional creators of the structure that we're still using globally today with America having, you know, taking over the franchise effectively. But even though a lot of that was market focused, their grand strategy was Britannia rules the waves. So we have naval supremacy, which gives us commercial naval supremacy. So we physically control supply chains. We physically control India, which we extract wealth from over hundreds of years and also extract manpower from, because the British army was largely Indian labor at that particular point. All the officers might've been British, but we needed Indian troops, sepoys, to be doing the fighting for us. Um, and then those two things together were matched with what we called a splendid isolation from Europe, where we never allowed anyone in Europe to dominate it. We would have no permanent friends, no permanent allies, and we would use uh, politics, you know, diplomacy, economic power, military power as necessary to make sure anyone in Europe got too big, we went to war with them. And that strategy worked brilliantly for the UK for hundreds of years. And whatever policy you're looking at with whichever prime minister from whichever party, right the way up until the end of World War II, when of course, as I said, America took over the franchise, that's what guided all their actions because that was their national interest and that allowed a tiny little island with a small population with very few natural resources to become the global superpower that it was. So most big countries have an underlying grand strategy and how they emerge is messy. But when you understand that, you have to look at the toolkit that they're using. And I don't talk about the military because that's not my thing, but we know that's, that's a reality in the background. And there's no need to talk about politics because that's obviously you know, diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera. Linked to this, but different. We're just looking at the economic toolkit. And you look there, you've got trade, all the different mechanisms you can use. And tariffs obviously are there and subsidies and non-tariff barriers, et cetera, et cetera. You've got capital where you get involved with money flows. And you've got other, because people think that, okay, you've got trade, you've got capital, nothing else can be economic statecraft. No, monetary policy can be statecraft. Central banks have been statecraft since the beginning of time. The Bank of England was set up to fight a war with France. That's why we set it up, not to fight inflation. And that <laughs> model was true right the way across Europe. Um, fiscal policy is always economic statecraft. What are you spending your money on? Your national priorities, right? So is infrastructure. 
So's energy, obviously, today. So's food. So's everything. If the focus of that policy isn't just your domestic electorate, it's also your national interests externally. And so what the paper does, and it's a long one, and maybe we can put a link you know, underneath the chat yeah. so people can read it. It tries to show how that toolkit works and how it looks very different from the toolkit you think you have if you're an economist. Because if you're an economist, you talk about interest rates, you talk about fiscal policy, you talk about tariffs, you understand one thing. If you're doing economic statecraft, you're looking at the same things and you're rubbing your hands and you're thinking, no, no, that's not how we use them. We use them very differently. Thank you very much. Well, I think that's a, that, that's a great way to kind of lay out what, what I'd like to kind of get into next, because in many ways, I would argue for the last 60, 70, 80 years, whatever number you want to pick, the U.S. has used um, its military, it has used its uh, geopolitical institutions, whether you want to call it the World Bank, the United Nations, the, you know, the... The, the status quo, right? The institutions that were set up, you know, post Bretton Woods or, or post World War II to kind of let them have, uh, you know, their grand plan for the world. And during much of the last 20 or 30 years, they somewhat sold out or gave away whatever, however you want to describe this, um, their domestic um economic capacity and became very commercialized or financialized, uh, service oriented economy. And they did that based on economic theory in a time of peace, right? Or, or th that's kind of the way I describe it. But I also kind of started realizing, I don't know, probably not as soon as you did, but may maybe a few years after you did that because of all the debt in the world, many countries, including the United States, were going to start having economic problems. And those economic problems would not be able to be solved in a laissez-faire free market type world. Or I didn't think that they would be solved in that. I, I thought the way countries would start having to deal with those problems would end up causing conflict either regionally or globally or whatever it was. And I kind of, so I, I, I kind of, I kind of, you know, termed it a Game of Thrones because the U.S. was the dominant player. Many of the other countries didn't like being subservient to the United States. And with all the economic problems, it was a good excuse to, you know, kind of start uh, pushing back a little bit. But then Trump comes along, right? And, and like I said, I thought this would happen to a certain extent anyway out of necessity. But with someone like Trump coming along, he not only is making it a necessity, he's just making it his priority. So, you know, make America great again, which we all know is the slogan for him to get reelected. I think he really believes it. Right. And 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 not only does he have the presidency, he, he now has the Senate and it looks like he's going to have the House of Representatives. And he's such a wild card globally that the rest of the world doesn't quite know how to deal with him. And so I kind of feel like if anybody was going to implement this grand macro strategy, as you have laid out, it's him and it's his administration. It's, and it's the people that are, are he's putting in place um, to do this because it, it's a little bit different. It, it's, 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 it's strange in that, Focusing on the U.S. focusing on the U.S. primarily actually causes incredible problems for the rest of the world. Sure, sure. Right. And, I, and I'm not sure if that's quite well understood. Maybe it is. But but I seem to get a lot of pushback when I say that in that Trump's policies really do kind of end up the, you know, upend the global order. I mean, this is not the way things were designed. Like the global reserve currency is meant to be distributed to the rest of the world. If all of a sudden it stops getting distributed at the same rate, but the rest of the world still needs it because of all the debt, it just causes a whole host of problems. And so I, I'd love to get your thoughts on how the, the global grand, the glo grand macro strategy through the eyes of Trump and the Trump administration, um, you know, how you think that plays out 
you know, in relation to Europe, how it plays out in relation to China. Um, but because on the one hand, it causes all kinds of problems. But on the other hand, Trump always is willing to make a deal. And he's always spoken, you know, I'm happy to do a deal with Z. I'm happy to do a deal with, with Russia. I don't, he's always like, I don't want to be enemies with these people, but we're going to have America, you know, get treated better first. And so I'm not sure those two are mutually compatible, but I, I'd love to get your thoughts on it. Sure. Well, first of all, no one knows what's going to happen. Yeah. And it's going to be very volatile. We can both agree on that. Um, I mean, just the immediate post-election trade, you can, you can see that already being baked in. But um, on top of that, we have to say that while Trump has, I think, a very good instinct for these things, excuse me, sorry, <coughs> frog in my throat from all the travel. While Trump has a very good instinct for these things, obviously no one's going to pretend that he's reading any papers I'm writing on grand macro <laughs> strategy. It, it's purely, purely instinctive rather than intellectual. But I do happen to know some of the people around him are thinking yeah. along these lines and do see the world in similarly, uh, you know, cross-disciplinary interdimensional spaces and or multidimensional spaces. And they, they can certainly see how things link up. So let's let's break it down bit by bit. Obviously, he wants America to be successful again and strong again and remain global number one. Um, but he wants to do that within a system that doesn't see a the accumulation of debt, which you've correctly pointed to and b the deterioration in physical supply within the American economy, which runs parallel. And it's very important that we remember that there's the physical economy and the financial one. And they're, yep. you know, they're joined at the hip, even if America is now a largely financialized economy. So versus China, clearly what the strategy will have to be is we don't want war with China, which is, of course, you know, Trump's making very, very clear he's not a war hawk, which is a great place to start. But um, if you're not going to go that route, even the economic strategy you pursue has to be careful because if you push it too far, you can end up there and you don't want to. What you need to do is bring as much manufacturing back to A, America, and B, close allies of America who are going to be happier to remain within an American geopolitical and geoeconomic orbit. So say, for example, if America is running a trade deficit, which it still will, trust me, with some countries, it has to be one which unquestionably wants to recycle that back into the dollar market and absolutely sees itself as an extension of America, if you will, like Japan nowadays, for example. Of course, yeah. it's a sovereign state, but everyone knows that in reality, when America blows a whistle, Japan is going to be there, right? So that's going to happen rapidly. And in fact, we've just seen a headline in the past couple of hours talking about a very major US textile producer, which is looking, looking at slashing its output from China and moving to places like Vietnam and Cambodia. Now, I don't know if that's a very good long-term strategy for them because they're right on the Chinese doorstep and that's a, you know, I would imagine they probably need to be a little bit closer to America at some point for that to really yeah. work. But you see the principle there. Now that's nothing new, but I think what you're going to start to see is a, a much more strategic game where the states starts looking at China and at other countries and saying, look, we can use a combination of tariffs, uh, subsidies, uh, Fed swap lines to give you liquidity if you need it for macro stability. We've got all the tools in the toolkit here and FDI, of course, to make sure that we're going to look at certain key sectors that China currently dominates and say, right, we know that is clustered around cities A, B and C in China. We're going to tariff the hell out of that. That's just not yep. going to be coming in. We get to choose where it goes. We get to set up what the new physical supply chain is. Now, does that deal with the debt? Not in as much as that the debt trade deficit with America has just moved to another country, but you're guaranteed that those dollars are going to flow to buy treasuries. And you're guaranteed that they're not going to push back if you then start saying, by the way, we're also going to restructure the supply side of the US economy as much as we can to over time fill some of that gap. So you get that industry for 10 years or 15 years, and then maybe we want that one back, but you know, you've got a 15 year window in which you can move up the production ladder and then we'll see where we are then. So it's a movable game with movable parts. That's vis a vis China. I mean, China's response back to that, of course, the suggestion is they'll devalue the, the renminbi or allow it to depreciate, which at the moment they can keep up because of their trade surplus. Right. Then, of course, you know, the response for that, I think, is America saying, well, tariffs go even higher. They start at 60. Now they're 120. Now they're, and then you go into a downward spiral, at which point the renminbi, you know, if you extend forward the thought process, they can't afford to import oil or anything. And it becomes ridiculous. Right. So I actually think America, if it manages that carefully, can benefit from that process. That's an incredibly simplistic overview, and it overlooks the risk of a geopolitical flashpoint in something like Taiwan or versus the Philippines, for example, the South China Sea, where China could say, we can see the game, 
we're going to jump to the end point here to see whether you really want to get to the hot war phase and test you yeah. on that front. And I hope, I hope that doesn't happen, but you can see the potential tail risk of that happening. But I think the economic strategy makes sense. Now, please let, me, let, me, oh, let, let me ask you, let me ask you a question really quick before we go on to Europe, because I, I, I know already that many people are out there are saying, oh, we can't put tariffs on. Tariffs will just boomerang back and they will hurt the U.S. more than they hurt China. We don't make anything. This was proven during COVID. And listen, I'm not I'm not sitting here and saying that tariffs will be easy, that there's no there's no you know adverse effects. But I think partly the idea that tariffs are automatically bad again goes back to economic thought in a peaceful world it exactly. isn't does it, it 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 doesn't take into consideration the new world that we are in and and i would if you don't mind if you could just spend a couple minutes yeah. talking about why tariffs don't necessarily have to crush the united states and why we might actually be able to move some man again the other argument is you know manufacturing will never come back right yeah. but you again you have done as good a job of anybody as explaining why just hold on keep an open mind here's where it can actually work so if you could just uh, touch on that for a couple of minutes that'd be great sure okay so very quickly let me look at it from three different angles historical theoretical and practical okay yeah so the historical one and i mentioned this briefly uh in the report that i just put out and much more so in one i did eight years ago just after trump won his first term in office where i said <clears throat> exactly what you just said that the current American obsession with free trade is a post-World War II, and in fact, post-Cold War obsession. Yep. If you look at American history, every president up to World War II was a deep protectionist. You grew into the United States of America, you know, hegemon you are today, with protectionism. If you hadn't had protectionism, you would be a large farm for the British today. It's as simple as that. <laughs> yeah. No, it's yeah. true. No, it's yeah, yeah. yeah. Advantage yeah. Said, Hey, just keep growing crops. Why the hell do you need industry? Britain makes everything, you know. Um, you, you, so you'd, you'd still basically be a giant garden rather than an independent country with you know the superpower that you are. So the history is quite clear. America has had tariffs forever, up until post World War Two, post Cold War. Even when it had free trade post World War Two, it was only with allies. It didn't have it with communist countries mainly. So it's only with the whole world post post Cold War, and that's a an economic policy period, not an economic statecraft period. So that's the history showing you that we can go back there. And I've been making that point for a long time. And in terms of the theory, I mean, Michael Pettis writes brilliantly on this. And, uh, you know, I, I don't write anywhere as well as him, but uh, read either myself for a brief, brief version or Pettis for a fuller one. But clearly, you can see that if you are looking at the theory of how free trade works, Smith and Ricardo both argued against free trade as we practice it today, because they argued, Ricardo in particular, that there should be no international mobile capital, that you can't be able to move your money from one country to another to set up shop with technology in another place and export back to your, back to your home country and presume that you'll get comparative advantage emerging. You're shifting comparative advantage as you shift that technology to a country that could never innovate it itself. And if we were seeing natural comparative advantage, which is what Ricardian theory in economics says, you shouldn't have any trade surpluses unless you're Saudi Arabia, where all you've got is oil and you don't import much. Everybody else should have balanced trade all the time. But the, the composition of that trade basket should just shift. That's not what we see. We see enormous exporters like China and enormous importers like the US, which tells you that's not what we're getting. We're getting structural mercantilism, you know, the, the ability to just try and focus on exports and not importing, which, by the way, America used to do under statecraft. Right. Did it very well. OK, so and now let's get to the practical one really quickly. Everyone who's modeling tariffs is a traditional economic policy thinker. All of them. As a result, before they even start, they know they don't work and they're inflationary. <laughs> no, exactly. No, I mean, I, I know that for a fact no, 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 yeah. <laughs> all the time. But if you listen to what Steve Besant, Trump's economic advisor, is saying in public. He's saying something I argued in 2017, which actually Trump didn't do, but that doesn't mean he won't do it this time. Hopefully, you know, if he's going to, he does it the right way if, he, if he's going to. You don't introduce tariffs on everything day one, 20% on the whole world, including things that we can't produce and don't want to produce, right. and 60% on China starting tomorrow, because that would be a real shock to the economy in the way economists are describing it. No, no. You're more selective where you focus them. 
sometimes you do it as an aggressive negotiating tactic to make sure that you gain market access where you currently don't have it. But thirdly, and most importantly, you introduce them T plus X. So for example, Trump gets in in January and says, January 2027, 60% tariff on everything made in China coming into the US. I'm also going to be monitoring all imports coming through American ports and post. And if we see any pickup, I'm going to start tariffing you on it immediately. So if you start trying to front load your imports, you pay tariffs now. Otherwise, it's two years, right? What do you think is going to happen over those next two years? Everyone's going to open a factory in America. You will get a massive capex boom. Now, is that inflationary? Yeah, it's inflationary growth. I mean, wages will go up. Employment will go up. Factories will be springing up everywhere. New logistics, new infrastructure. When the tariff kicks in, ideally, there's no inflationary effect because you've increased your supply side. You've just put up a barrier to make sure that that doesn't go away again back to China the way it happened when you first lowered, lowered your tariffs against China. So what's the output from that? One other thing I just have to add here. You narrow your trade deficit. Now, as I said, some trade deficit is going to remain with some countries. Of course it is. Let's be realistic. But if a great big chunk of it disappears, well, that's good for growth. That's good for revenue because capital circulates within the country. And if you look at the intersecting balance sheets within the US, that's a positive. And internationally, it's a negative because, as you rightly said, there are fewer dollars flowing out into the euro dollar system to service outstanding US dollar debts in the euro dollar system. Everybody else then becomes more vulnerable to a dollar squeeze. And that gives the Federal Reserve in America even more power than it has now to start saying, who's our friends? And who aren't our friends? Who gets dollars and who doesn't get dollars? Who, who so gets them and who doesn't? Play- That's it. You know, I think the the you know a lot of people believe. And listen, I I, I don't disagree with this. Like w- when there's a liquidity crunch, the the Fed will supply dollars. I mean that that's what they do. But <laughs> that is you know I I think everybody that is familiar with swap lines, again, is familiar with swap lines in a post world war ii post cold war scenario and to your point that is made in the paper you can use that as statecraft you don't just have to give everybody liquidity you can pick and choose who gets the liquidity and it's always better to be you know at the front of the line (laughs) than at the back and so i i i i'm not sure that that people quite appreciate um the power that the Fed has not from a monetary domestic policy standpoint, but from a geopolitical tool of statecraft point. And, you know, Trump has already made comments about wanting to have some input on interest rates. Yeah. Um, I, I think anybody who thinks that the Fed is going to offer swap lines to somebody that Trump doesn't like, and Trump is just going to sit back and say, no problem, I think is extremely naive. And so I, 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 I think, you know, and I'm not, listen, I'm not, a, I'm not saying that these, these are all great things. I don't necessarily think Trump should have the power to, to, to do all these things, but he is who he is. Right. And we're in the situation we're in, we're in the environment that we're in. And I think, uh, you know, this, the, this statecraft, as you call it, I think is front and center. I think, I think that in many ways takes a backseat to everything else at this point, especially, when his whole slogan is, you know, make America great again. I completely agree. Um, and the, the interesting thing is, you know, at the beginning, you said this would have been the same whether Harris had won. And, I, and again, I, I agree on that. I could have rewritten the paper at the end just to tweak that. Sure. This is a game of chess being played, whether you want to call it 3D chess, 4D chess, whatever. It's a game of chess. The only thing that changes with Trump's election is a recognition it's a game of chess rather than thinking it's checkers and a yeah. recognition you can use all the pieces. Because under under the Harris Biden administration or Biden Harris whatever you want to want to call it you know projecting that forward if she had one, um, they are not fully recognizing that. For example, they're always saying, well, obviously we're going to co- collaborate with China and others where we can, and compete you know within a nice Queensbury rules. You know these are the rules of, of, of boxing where we have to. That's not how statecraft works. Statecraft is mixed martial arts with, you know, or it's Krav Maga, yeah. you know, where you can pick up a book and throw it at someone. It's, it's really, really all holds barred to get stuff done. And whether you like that or not, and I'm not saying I do, at least now you have someone it looks like in the States who's prepared to try and use Krav Maga, although the, the, 
the mental image of trying to imagine Trump physically doing something like that is, <laughs> is, is rather disturbing. But it just means. Did you hear? You know, you know, you know that makes me. I don't know if you saw this or not. At one of his rallies over the last week or so, you know how he just starts ad libbing and just, you know, who, who knows what he's going to say? And he sees some like really like strong guy in the audience. He says, "Look at this guy." Look at the body on this guy. This guy's got more muscles than Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he said, I always wanted a body like that, but I didn't want to do the work. And I just thought that was like such a Trump moment. It was, and of course the crowd loved it and it was just hilarious. But, uh, um, you know, one other thing I wanted to ask you, uh, to, to, to if, if you don't mind explaining this, because I think this is the, the argument that I often get after I say tr tariffs aren't necessarily going to crush the United States right away um, is that they will say, well, nobody is going to build a plant in the United States. They will just sell their production elsewhere. Maybe you could explain why they will build a plants in the U S and why they can't just sell their production elsewhere. Well, demand. <laughs> it's as simple as that. <laughs> I mean, if the U.S. I, I would like somebody else besides me to explain this, so if you don't mind. It, in America, is the world's largest economy still. We know it has a mountain of problems. We could do a whole yeah. chat for two hours on that. And we know that it's undergone extensive uh, what I call EMification. Some people call it Brazilification, you know, where not as many people are enjoying the American dream. Both sides of the election divide were saying the same thing. Um, but that doesn't mean it can't be reversed with the correct policy usage, it, it, you know, some kind of short term, short term disruption and volatility and not at, not to everyone's benefit, as, as, as I'm underlining. It's very much a, a zero sum game that's good for America and its friends and not for everyone else. But the demand is still there. You still have an enormous consumer base. And if you are putting in place a policy that promises to see the American consumer come roaring back. Look, I work with CEOs and CFOs all the time. And they're already saying, well, demand in China is flat as a pancake. Demand in India is looking pretty good, by the way, which I think would be definitely an economy that's sympathetic with America uh, and under Trump. Modi gets along well with him. Um, Europe is just you know, not non-existent. Japan is non-existent. You have to find growth somewhere. So if you're going to juice an economy with tax cuts and with government incentives similar, by the way, to what Biden brought in with the Inflation Reduction Act, et cetera, et cetera, or the CHIPS Act, which was trying to be done through fiscal stimulus, you're doing a similar thing by basically saying, ideally, two years from now, it's going to be much more expensive to bring that in. So just come and build it here. And I can absolutely guarantee you they will. And if if you see any sign that they're lagging because of X, Y, or Z, and there could be factors like, you know, we can't find the qualified labor, et cetera, et cetera. These are issues. Well, then that's where statecraft also kicks in, because I said it's all policies. You know, education would have to be involved. Maybe you've got to set up technical colleges very, very rapidly to get people reskilled, not four year degrees where you run around being extreme, you know, with, with, with signs that, you know, were pretty controversial you know, in and around the last election. OK, maybe you need to look at all those kind of things. Maybe you need to look at logistics and infrastructure. All these can be done. And in fact, bringing it back to monetary policy and fiscal policy, it wouldn't surprise me, hypothetical, and I don't see this, this is not a forecast to be clear, but if you're playing the statecraft game, you're looking at where the pieces can move. Why couldn't you, rather than doing it with fiscal, a direct fiscal, why couldn't you be doing some form of QE into the supply side? So for example, you have a, a, a new acronym or, or Fed channeling mechanism that here's a like a MAGANomics, here's a subsidy that goes towards making sure off book in this particular vehicle here, one way or another, that building that supply side temporarily is, is more manageable fiscally. Because if you don't do that, you don't have the physical side of the economy to allow yourself to ever escape from the debt side of the economy. And then you do lose the statecraft game. So, of course, in that situation, of course, you are allowed to do it. Yeah. You know, something Russell Napier has talked a lot about is especially he, he talked about this many years ago, but it, he really kind of started hammering on it uh, post COVID when, you know, during the PPP uh, fiscal spend uh, by the Congress. And then they also, you know, directed, you know, fiscal spending towards industries in their states and stuff. And 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 he made the, the comment that that monetary policy is now being driven by the fiscal side rather than the monetary policy side. I wonder what you think about that under Trump. Um, I, I think that's a little bit kind of what you're talking about now, whether you call it 
QE from the Fed or whether it's you know fiscal spending from the government, you can direct it towards certain industries or certain states or certain um, you know nationally significant uh, from a security standpoint or from an industrial standpoint. Um, you, you could channel funds towards those industries. Do, do you think that is more of a more of a uh, likelihood w w with Trump, uh, or, or do you think it would happen anyway, or do you not agree at all? No, no, I, I can see that happening. I think they would want to make it look very different from anything that the Biden admin did, obviously. Sure. And I'm not saying they'll do it day one. In fact, if you look up very publicly what Musk and you know uh, people around him are saying, they want to start with trying to trim as much fat as possible from the federal budget. And frankly, again, I'm not trying to be political here. Um, everyone's entitled to their own view. And I'm not anti-government. I want to make that very, very clear personally. But whether you work for a private sector organization or a public sector one, you never have to look far to see that there's someone doing a job that actually doesn't need that job. And there's a process involved in a system that doesn't need to be there. So, I mean, X, for example, what must buy 75 percent of the staff. And as far as I can see, it's still working, even if it's not yeah. an environment that everyone feels the same about as they used to. But that's that's just a matter of choice. Right. So physically, that still works as a product. Um, if they can do that to the federal government, then maybe they don't need to do it to the extent I'm describing because they've managed to make those kind of savings. And one of the key things you have to recognize when you're playing the statecraft game is even if you can use the pieces on the board differently, you can't always just create a new piece. So yeah. if you can reallocate this pawn here from being rather uselessly in the corner and move it across the board to somewhere it's important, that can help. So if you can manage to reallocate labor away from, let's call it dead bureaucracy, um, and into, say, welding, so that you're ready to actually start you know, making aircraft carriers again or something in the States, just purely hypothetically. That's not a bad trade-off within you know, the fixed pot of assets or the stretchable but largely fixed pot of assets you've got within the US. But I, I do think you are going to have to see some very creative policies going forward. And we've, we've spoken about this before. Monetary policy and fiscal policy will have to work together. They'll absolutely have to. And they will not be operating, I believe, over time in an economic policy environment. Yes, they'll talk about inflation. Yes, they'll talk about the Fed's dual mandate, you know, with unemployment. Of course they will. That doesn't go away. And they may not publicly say what they're doing because they don't want to freak out people who aren't prepared to understand it. But it could well be over time, if the statecraft game is played, that you start seeing very, very different parallel strategies operating that only people like yourself, myself, and people who listen to us will actually have the lenses to understand. Okay, so you know, coming back to the election for a second, I'm, let's put ourselves, you know, in in the the chairs of of other countries. Like, if if you're China and if you're Europe or or you know whoever you are, what do you do now that Trump is back in power? Like, do you change your strategy? Do do you, you know, do you play nice with Trump? Do you stand up to Trump? Do you you know focus on your domestic economy or what? What's their play? Great question. I mean, first of all, of course, everyone's thinking exactly that. I would imagine it will be a combination of all of them. And you try and stand up to him or to at least get his respect. But you, of course, reach out to him and try and shake his hand, try and offer him what you think is a quick short term deal in the hope that all he wants to get is a couple of bucks in his pocket and walk away. And I don't think that's the case anymore. I think it's far more pressing and structural. And again, I know some of the people around him certainly see it in these existential terms now rather than you know, short, short term pocket, like, for example, the trade, the phase one trade deal with China, which was just, you know, far, fast one trade deal, I called it when it came out, you know, is that there, was, there, there was no trade deal there, it was never going to be adhered to. So if it's something short term, it's like that, it will be another fast that won't really change anything. China, though, I think very much is thinking, okay, worst case scenario, they're rumored to be introducing a huge fiscal stimulus package, most much of it is just new debt for old. But some of it is starting to look at stimulating the consumer sector there to buy up the extra consumer goods they won't be able to sell to America. So that's what China will do. Maybe the currency will move lower. And as I said, maybe that creates a downward spiral. Maybe they'll get geopolitical. We can hope not. But that's your worst case fat tail risk. OK, in yeah. Europe, absolute consternation, uh, wailing and gnashing of teeth because they've had four years to prepare for this and have done absolutely nothing as usual. Um, but there were some recent interesting articles saying that some in Europe realized this might be the springboard they need to actually, you know, do something. Because the German government has just collapsed. Francis yep. Macron, his government has collapsed and he's only got, you know, what, 
two years left in office before he's he's out. No one no one knows who's going to come next, and it could be the far right. Um, many other European countries' governments are kind of held together with toothpaste and string. But Brussels, as an overarching umbrella, has got very, very clear plans. And, you know, myself and my team put together a paper nearly two years ago saying, if Europe gets caught between America and China in the geopolitical world, where it can't export to them, but they force Europe to buy their imports, which is what we're talking about with Make America Great Again and what China's already doing, Europe's in real trouble because any stimulus there pushes up the supply side of inflation. So commodities go up, but they have no one to export to. And all they do is get a larger and larger trade deficit because they have no commodity production at home. So it's kind of like 2002 for them with the Ukraine shock over and over again. And they get structurally higher inflation, structurally lower growth, structurally angrier populations. Young people drift and move to America or, you know, or Australia, wherever they can. It's a disaster scenario. Now, we, we printed that paper two years ago. And I made the economist team jerry-rig how the model worked. Because you know economic models always show everything will be okay. <laughs> no, you know that. They do. It's a seesaw. If you, they if you do. Work, they do. That, well, no, they I, absolutely do. Models, they say, well, if we push this down, that has to go up. It has yeah. to. It can't not. That's how they work. I'm not joking. No. They cannot show you a bad outcome unless you put in a tariff or something like that. And then they can. This is why I love talking to you. You, you always have these great little... Go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so anyway, anyway they... they, they um, I forced them to say, can you jerry-rig the model to show that you can't export, you can only import, etc. And you get like a scenario where Europe starts to look more and more like Greece. So it's really, really bad. So we published that two years ago. And then a year ago, coming up for now, we published a paper talking about what Europe would have to do to get what they call open strategic autonomy, which is still now their grand strategy. They've kind of announced it as their grand strategy, yeah. which is to stand on our own two feet. And it's like, you need to get commodities, which they haven't got. Good luck with that. So you need to have yeah. supply chains to countries that have commodities that will deal in euro only with you. Good luck with that, because they're mainly in Africa and they're mainly in Russia or Turkey or America's pocket, okay? Um, or China's pocket. Then on top of that, you need a large military. Then on top of that, you need masses of spending, not just on the military, but industrial subsidies. You need a lot of high tariffs against others. So you break your free trade model and you've got to have, you know, a scale up in Europe. So that you've got this, this size of Europe rather than lots of national economies. So we estimated they were going to have to spend anywhere between four and six percent of GDP extra a year. Just the government. Forget about the private sector. Starting immediately which breaks all their budget rules because they already have a deficit well above their budget targets. So everything gets ripped up that they believe in. So we published that a year ago and we said, that's the only way you get there. The Draghi report on the future of European competitiveness, which didn't get a lot of play in the States, but trust me, it's big in Europe. He's former president of Italy. Sorry, uh, yeah, uh, no, yeah, prime minister of Italy, excuse me. Uh, former um, ECB president, complete consummate Euro insider. He comes out recently and says, yeah, we need to spend four, five percent of GDP, X, Y, Z, tick, 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 tick. The only thing is he thinks the private sector is going to do it and the government doesn't have to do a lot, which is a joke because it's going to be the government. Yeah. So Europe's going to have to do all of that. And maybe now if Trump starts playing hardball with them, which I think he will, they will realize there is no alternative because Draghi was really clear. You don't do that. It's slow agony. That's what he called it, slow agony. Yeah. And that's what it will be for Europe. So I'm, I'm sorry if I'm talking too long, but basically everyone no, no, no. is realizing they've got to play this game. They may not want to play chess. They've got to pick up those pieces and start playing. So the last topic I want to touch on, and we, we, put, it's, you know, we, we said we were going to try to keep this to 45 minutes. I think you, you, you know that I could sit here and talk to you for four hours. <laughs> so we're going to try to keep this somewhat uh, you know, time sensitive. And I'm going to touch on the topic that, that, that's probably the most controversial and probably the one that we could spend the most time on. And that is the changes taking place in the Middle East. Um, you know, it's, 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 and, and I, with Trump coming in again, it affects everything in the Middle East. And so if you could just give us your quick, you know, two minute overview of what's going on in the Middle East and what it means geopolitically for the US, for the BRICS, for China, for Russia, and, and, and but mainly for the, for, for the Middle East itself. Sure, okay, very brief overview before we get more granular. And people can be very free to disagree with my particular view on this because the Middle East is a polarizing area with polar opposite analysis of what's driving it. But what I see as being the key factor here, particularly from an American standpoint, 
is that under the Obama administration for eight years, and then Biden for the past four, you have had one policy running through it as a common thread, which is we don't want to get sucked into another Middle Eastern war. Who does? That's a very sensible policy. But the way to ensure that happens is to have a regional power who's large enough and stable enough and important enough that they can basically be our friend there and ensure that everything runs nicely without us having to have troops and, and boots on the ground. And they thought that was Iran. And I, I still know, I talk to people who have disbelief. They can't understand that that could possibly be the policy when Iran still burns the American flag daily, you know, and screams death to the big Satan and death to Israel, the small Satan. I can assure you that was the policy, or at least from all the research I've done. Um, and when you look at the actions that were continually taken, like easing sanctions, trying to do this nuclear deal with it, with Iran, et cetera, which allowed them to have a, you know, to get all the way to there being a threshold nuclear state at some point in the future anyway. Uh, and any number of steps taken by the Biden White House too. You can say, yeah, that, that does make sense if you look at it like that. Now, it was never going to work because Iran was never interested in, in being that American ally in the region. It was interested in expanding its footprint and it sure has. You know, it's now much like an octopus with tentacles everywhere affecting the U.S. and everyone. Um, but it's not doing it in a pro-Western, pro-European, pro-American way. And it won't it won't do. It's siding absolutely with China uh, and with Russia and with and with North Korea. That's very much uh, it's not an axis and then they're not cooperating, you know, like, like NATO do. But across dimensions, there's, there is absolutely aid and assistance and a willingness to help each other, like Iran is producing weapons and technology that it sends to Russia. Russia is talking about helping Iran with its nuclear technology. China is uh, obviously buying Iranian oil, which is sanctioned, and everyone looks the other way, even though they know it's happening, including the states. Um, and obviously is, uh, you know, sending technology to, to Iran. And North Korea is sending troops to fight alongside Russia and Ukraine, from what we hear. Um, and Russia has signed a mutual defense pact with North Korea. So those countries are all cooperating in different dimensions. So American policy under Trump has already been stated, as I saw the headlines this morning, no, it's going to put Iran back in a box again. It's going to do everything they can to weaken Iran. Now, again, worst case scenario, because there are always fat tails, Iran can try and run for a nuclear weapon, which it's much, much closer to now than it was a few years ago. And if it were to get there and say, we now have that capability, then they're not far away from saying, now we can militarize it and put it in a ballistic missile warhead, and now we can blow up Europe or the States. And North Korea can help them with that. Then we get into really, really, really ugly scenarios where you don't worry about where the dollar is trading, quite, quite frankly. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I, I don't focus on that too much, but I wanted to stress to people that that's your nightmare scenario. But provided that doesn't occur, and let's hope that rational heads prevail and that people don't go down that particular route, I think over the next couple of years, you are, you're going to see the flow of funds to Iran cut off. But to do that, that means the states is going to have to stop them selling oil to China, which means that they're going to have to start sanctioning China, at which point then China is dragged into this immediately and it becomes multidimensional. Uh, Russia, where Trump would like to do in Ukraine, absolutely would like to do a deal on their terms vis-a-vis -vis Ukraine. Um, and maybe Trump would like to do that too. I'm not trying to project onto him what he would or won't do, but it will want to keep as many other fronts burning hot as it can do to keep America distracted on other fronts. So everyone has skin in the game in trying to make sure that as many geopolitical flashpoints as possible are burning hot. But I think if they can manage to keep them from boiling over, the Trump vision is going to be an extension of the Abraham Accords where Saudi Arabia will sign a deal with Israel. Israel will have to do some kind of deal with the Palestinians. I don't think it's going to be for the state the Palestinians want, but it will be some kind of deal, which if the Saudis sign up for it and Iran is put in a box, no one else is really going to be in a position to push back against and say, you know, there'll be no political rallying cry except on Western university campuses that this isn't acceptable. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm being facetious, but, but I think quite accurate in that comment at the same time. And then potentially you start to see India getting sucked into this too. And there was talk before about an India, Middle East, Europe economic corridor. And you can start looking at India emerging as a production base via the Middle East, via Saudi Arabia, via Jordan, uh, via, via Israel into Europe. And you can start looking at completely alternative economic geography to the Belt and Road, to China, to the BRICS, etc. And that it all runs through the Middle East. You know, it's it's so funny. Uh, 
much of history, much of economics, much of statecraft, much of geopolitics, it all ends up running through the Middle East. It, 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 it's, it, it's an amazing, it's an amazing thing. Um, well, hey, you know, like I said, we, we, we could probably continue this conversation for another couple hours, but we, we, we've kept you close to an hour already. I always appreciate you taking the time out to talk to me. Uh, I know the audience here is going to love to hear your thoughts. And if, 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 if we can, we'll put a link to... Uh, to your 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 grand macro strategy report in, in the in the description of of of, of the show here, um, great I'm because glad. I because I think it's a fantastic piece and it, it it's a you know for for people that are listening it's just a fantastic uh, framework to think about the world ahead. Um, you know I, I have my framework that helps me think about markets, but Michael's framework really helps me think about geopolitics and kind of strategy. So uh, I would definitely encourage people to, to to read the report and kind of just set it on their desk and refer back to it quite often. Because again, this isn't something that he just came up with in the last week. He's literally been talking about this stuff for seven or eight years now. And uh, he's he's been at the forefront of, of, of what's happening for longer than anybody else I know personally. So um, anyway, thanks for having uh, taking the time to be with us and, um, you know, get some sleep. I know it's going to be a crazy uh, few weeks, months and years. And you. Thanks very much.